Okay. So, if God is absolutely sovereign, he exercises all inclusive control down to the most minute detail, and if he ordains all things according to his divine purpose and will, then why exactly should Christians pray? How can our prayers influence the plans of an infinitely powerful God who already knows the end from the beginning and who has already established a decree that is eternal? And if God will execute all of his holy will, then why pray? Now, when this question is raised, it's, it's typically not raised as an objection to prayer, right? It's not like uh, there are people out there who are arguing that Christians shouldn't pray generally. Uh, all Christians acknowledge the biblical command to pray and the value that prayer has for our lives. Rather, the question is often raised in efforts to either grapple with or to challenge the doctrine of God's sovereignty. And so it reflects a deeper concern about how God's sovereignty and um, human responsibility can coexist and how human beings can act meaningfully in the world. And so by raising the question, uh, one might challenge the idea that God is absolutely sovereign because they might suggest that maybe there are areas that are outside of God's sovereignty or uh, maybe there are things that are beyond God's control. Well, you know, obviously that's a, it's a thorny issue, but it is an issue to which our text for this morning speaks. So let's open our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Uh, this morning we'll be in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 19. Daniel 9, verses 1 through 19. So uh, up to this point in the book of Daniel, we've seen that God is sovereign over the kingdoms of the earth, and no matter how powerful those kingdoms might seem at some moment, uh, God is using them purposefully in the lives of his people. Uh, we've seen that although Daniel and his friends face various challenges while uh, the, the people of Israel are in exile in Babylon, uh, they do nevertheless continue to remain faithful. And uh, the central idea of the book of Daniel is that God is sovereign over the nations and faithful to bring about his purposes in the lives of his people. Uh, but again, if God is sovereign in that way, then how is it that our, our prayers can be meaningful and significant? So uh, look with me at Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, uh, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to the prophet or to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So uh, Darius served as a king over the Babylonian Empire, or the, uh, the, the Babylonian province in the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, he served immediately following King Belshazzar, who was the king under whom Daniel received the vision about the, um, the ram and the goat in uh, the previous chapter, in uh, chapter 8. Uh, it was also Darius back in Daniel 6 who established those 120 satraps, and uh, many of those leaders became jealous of Daniel and conspired against him to have the king uh, issue this edict where no one could worship or pray to anyone but the king for a period of 30 days. Uh, and they did that conspiring against Daniel because they knew that Daniel was going to be faithful to his God, that he wouldn't pray to King Darius, and therefore he's going to be guilty of a capital offense. And so it was this conspiracy against Daniel to try, and get, rid of, to try to get rid of Daniel. And uh, Daniel was thrown to the lions as a result. Uh, God intervened. He closed the mouths of the lions. Uh, but then the men who conspired against Daniel were themselves fed to the lions. And, and so what happens here in chapter 9 is roughly that same time period. 
uh, around 538 BC. And so uh, what happens here is that Daniel is reading God's word. He's reading the book of Jeremiah. And Daniel says, I perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So um, Daniel is reading in Jeremiah and in the book of Jeremiah in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, uh, this is before the Israelites went into exile, uh, the Lord warns them. And uh, the Lord says in Jeremiah 25, verse 11, he says, uh, This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So when it says there, uh, these nations, it's talking about Israel and the nations that would align with them against Babylon. Um, verse 12 in Jeremiah 25, it says, Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. So, all right. I thought it was me for a second. So uh, the, the, the idea in Jeremiah is that God is going to bring judgment on his people. Uh, the people are going to be taken out of the land. They're going to be brought into exile. But then after 70 years, the Lord would come against Babylon. And in Jeremiah 29, the Lord says, uh, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So after the 70 years, God is going to bring them back to reestablish them in the land of Israel. And so, you know, Daniel is reading Jeremiah, and he, as he reads this, he recognizes that God has promised to restore his people to the land after these 70 years. And, and at this point in time, as um, Daniel is reading this, it's basically been 69 years, or maybe even more. And so Daniel recognizes that the time is almost complete, and it prompts him to, to turn to the Lord in prayer. And when we read God's word, it should have that effect on our own lives, right? We believe that the Bible is God's word. We refer to the Bible as God's word. And uh, yet I'm not sure that we always think about the significance of, of what that means, right? Because when we stop and we remember that the words of scripture are the very words of the holy and transcendent God of the universe, when we remember that the scriptures are the words of the God who upholds the universe by the word of his power, uh, when we <clears throat> recognize that the, the God whose word this is is almighty and perfect in every way, that means that the words of scripture are incredibly weighty. Uh, they, they ought not to rest lightly upon us, and in fact, they are weighty beyond measure. They are weighty because the God who inspired them is a holy and awesome God. And, and so as Daniel reads God's word, he understands this. He understands that, that God is sovereign. He sees that God is uh, going to sovereignly restore his people to the land. But, but obviously that doesn't stop him from praying. Right? In fact, it actually leads him to pray. So, you know, those who say that God's sovereignty implies that we don't need to pray, they have it exactly backwards, right? When Daniel encounters God's word and he learns that God has sovereignly decreed to restore his people to the land after 70 years, he doesn't just say, okay, well, you know, uh, God, he, he sort of has this figured out. God's just going to do what God's going to do. And since God is going to do it, there's no need to pray about it. Right? That's not what Daniel does. When, when Daniel sees what God is about to do, it actually leads him to pray that the Lord would do the very thing that God has promised he will do. It leads uh, Daniel to a place of humility. It leads him to the place that he seeks God's mercy and that he's thankful for God's faithfulness. The, the, the doctrine of God's sovereignty should lead us to a sense of awe over who God is. Right, It should lead us to have thanksgiving because it means that God will most certainly accomplish his good purposes in our lives and, and that ought to drive us to, to seek him. You know, if, if, if in a deterministic universe we thought that every outcome was morally neutral, 
right? It was sort of, uh, you know, what will be, what is, is what will be, then we could just resign ourselves to the fact that God is going to do whatever he's going to do. Uh, but, but we don't believe that every outcome is morally neutral or insignificant, right? Uh, God has determined to glorify himself and we care deeply about God's purposes. So we ought to be like Daniel in the sense that when we behold the truth concerning what God has revealed in his word, that we can't help but to pray. And uh, even if God has promised to, to do certain things, God has promised that he will complete the work that he has started in us, to give one example. And, and so we can't really help but pray that God would complete that work uh, because it's so important to us. It's so significant to us. It's so meaningful. And, and we want so deeply for God to complete his, this work in our lives that we pray that he will do it, even though he's already promised that he will sovereignly bring it to pass. And uh, in God's sovereignty, God uses our prayers to accomplish those very purposes. And this is exactly what we see here in the life of Daniel. Uh, notice again in verse 3, after Daniel is reading Jeremiah and he sees that God is going to bring his people back into the land after 70 years, Daniel says, verse 3, he says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So in uh, Daniel's day, when a person put on sackcloth and ashes, uh, it communicated a sense of grief, uh, communicated a sense of mourning and sorrow. Uh, the, the ashes conveyed uh, really a sense of humility because the, the ashes were an acknowledgement of the fact that, that man is a creature from the dust, right? And it's from ashes to ashes, from dust to dust. We come from the dust and we return to the dust. And uh, likewise, fasting conveys a sense of seriousness that whatever the matter at hand is, it's so important that I'm not even going to divert my attention away from this thing, not even to eat. It, it conveys seriousness about what, what it is that is at hand. And, and so as Daniel turns to the Lord in prayer, he turns to God with the utmost sincerity and conviction and seriousness. He's not coming in to the Lord casually. He's approaching him with the seriousness and the gravity and the reverence that is appropriate given the situation that the people of Israel are in. Uh, he continues and he addresses God in verse 4. He says, uh, I prayed to the Lord, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And so notice that when Daniel addresses God, he focuses on who the Lord has revealed himself to be, right? He is the great and awesome God. And that description emphasizes the, the power of God and the authority of God. Uh, God's power and authority are breathtakingly spectacular. His, uh, his character is utterly awe-evoking. And Daniel says that God keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So God is infinitely powerful. He possesses infinite authority. And God exercises absolute faithfulness in his unwavering commitment to fulfill his promises to his people. So by acknowledging God's greatness and power and authority, by acknowledging God's faithfulness, Daniel is calling to mind the perfections of God, the power and character of the God to whom he now turns. Uh, Daniel continues in verse 5, and, and notice the contrast that Daniel presents between the God that he's just described and the people of Israel. Daniel says, verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us 
open shame as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, and we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, for, uh, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. So, Daniel confesses sin on behalf of the people of Israel, and, and notice that he doesn't mince words, right? He doesn't say that uh, we made a few mistakes. He doesn't say that we, we messed up a little bit here and there, or, um, you know, we made some poor choices, or had a, a lapse in judgment here or there. He says that they have sinned and acted wickedly and rebelled against God. He says, we didn't listen to your prophets, and the reason you drove us out of the land was because of the treachery that we committed against you. So when uh, Daniel prays and he confesses uh, their sins, he doesn't minimize sin, he doesn't downplay it, he doesn't uh, diminish the seriousness of it in any way. Rather, he actually seems to frame it in terms that emphasize the seriousness and the gravity of the sin that they've committed. In fact, you know, Daniel, he presents uh, really a, a contrast. There's a contrast between the, the God who is great and awesome and faithful and who loves those who keep his commandments on the one hand, and those who have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from God's commandments on the other. And so God is faithful, but we are unfaithful. Uh, God is great and awesome, but we are sinful and wicked. God maintains steadfast love to those who keep his commandments, but we have done wrong and turned aside from the Lord's commandments. So uh, again, Daniel isn't afraid to acknowledge that sin is sin. Uh, you may have seen this clip on YouTube, but uh, Joel, Joel Osteen famously told Larry King that uh, he doesn't use the word sin in uh, any of his messages, and yet the doctrine of sin is essential to the Christian gospel. The, the doctrine of sin is what teaches us about our need for redemption. And without understanding our wickedness and sin and depravity, we can't really even begin to understand the significance of what Christ did on the cross. And so when we, when we talk about sin in terms of, you know, making a mistake or having a lapse of judgment or a moment of indiscretion or something along those lines, we actually down to, downplay the gravity of sin and really uh, we downplay our need for salvation. So when we uh, minimize sin, it actually works to undermine the gospel. It makes the cross look small. Uh, it diminishes what Jesus has done, and it makes the salvation that we've experienced in Christ look small. Because if all I had was a lapse of judgment, well, you know, that's not a big deal. If I have committed cosmic treason and treachery against a holy God in wickedness and rebellion, that's a much bigger problem.
problem. And so um, when we minimize sin, it makes the God who brought us salvation look less glorious. And so it's important that we understand and acknowledge the seriousness of our sin, the gravity of our sin, and that's exactly what we see here from Daniel. Uh, Daniel confesses their sin honestly, he's open, and he expresses it in no uncertain terms. And uh, not only that, notice also Daniel recognizes that Israel's current circumstances are the direct result of their sin. Notice in the second part of verse 11, Daniel says, And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. Uh, because, you know, one way to deal with the problem of sin is to, to minimize it, to say, you know, we just had a lapse of judgment or something like that. Um, or uh, we can say that what we did wasn't wrong, right? We can rationalize it in some way. Another way to deal with sin is by blaming someone else. Uh, this is what Adam did in the, the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, re the reason that Adam tells God that he disobeyed and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because uh, the woman you gave me, right, she gave me of the fruit and I ate. And so, you know, it's like uh, Adam's in the garden and he's like, you know, Lord, when, when I was in the garden um, before uh, the woman came, everything was fine, right? I was in the garden, I was naming the animals, I was exercising dominion and cultivating the trees and, and being obedient. And not once did it occur to me that I should eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But then you made this woman, right? And you brought her. And after that, everything went downhill. And uh, and you can blame other people and spend all of your time fueling bitterness and resentment by blaming your circumstances on other people. Right? You can blame your spouse, you can blame your coworkers or your boss or your upbringing. And, and it's not that there isn't sometimes blame to go around, right? There are people who uh, are very seriously victimized. And it might actually be the case that when you blame someone else for your problems, that there really is fault to be assigned. But, but if we're trying to deal with difficult circumstances, simply fostering bitterness and resentment uh, by looking to the extent to which you're a victim isn't particularly helpful, right? Because you can always find someone else to blame. Or, uh, you know, maybe if you have trouble finding someone to blame, you can just blame society as a whole, right? You can blame the system. And so it's not just one person, it's everybody. It's the entire world that's, that's working against you. And, uh, or maybe it's the people in power, right? It's the people who are making the rules, the, the rich and the powerful people. And they have the, the deck sort of stacked against you. And if you blame society... Uh, as a whole, then you don't just become embittered against one person. Now you can become embittered against the whole world, right? And maybe you've uh, encountered people like that. Uh, or if you want to go even bigger than that, maybe you can just cultivate your anger and bitterness sufficiently enough that you can just skip all of the formalities and place the blame at the feet of God. And yet that's not what we see from Daniel. Daniel doesn't accuse God of setting them up to fail. Right? He doesn't say that God's rules are unfair and his judgments are too harsh and that the only reason that they're in exile is because God is too stern. Uh, Daniel says, in effect, he says, Lord, it's our fault. Right? We did this. Uh, the curses that were written in the law have come upon us because of our sin. And uh, whenever we encounter difficulty, if we take responsibility for our circumstances, that's, that's really the only way to move forward. Uh, and it may be that our circumstances weren't good to begin with, uh, but if you have a set of bad circumstances, there are a lot of things that you can do to make those circumstances worse. If you think about uh, families where you know, maybe you have a loved one who passes away and you've probably seen families that during, during a really difficult time like that, they come together, right? And they support one another, they comfort one another. Um, when uh, Stacy's dad passed away, in many ways, it was a time when the family came together. And though it's a really difficult time, there's, there's blessing in that. 
Um, but then you can also imagine that some families might not deal with the death of a loved one well, and maybe there are family members who start pointing the finger, they start blaming one another, and pretty soon someone's refusing to go to the funeral, someone's not speaking to someone else, and, and you have this really bad situation that becomes an unbearably worse situation because of the sin and pride that is at work under the surface. Uh, again, that's not the way Daniel responds, uh, and that's not the way that we, as God's people, should respond. And if you look at your circumstances and take your eyes off of the things that you are not able to control and focus on what it is that you might do differently, that's the best way out of the situation. Uh, and yet, unfortunately, up to this point in the story, that is not what Israel had done. Uh, notice again, verse 13, Daniel says, uh, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. And so uh, there had not been repentance, but this marks a, a turning point where Daniel is acknowledging their sin and uh, seeking God's grace and repentance. Now, uh, notice verse 16. Uh, Daniel prays, he says, O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not. For your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. So Daniel appeals to God based on God's purposes for the people of Israel. Right? Part of God's purpose for the people of Israel is that they would be a light and a blessing to the nations. And uh, we see that in the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, God promised that through Abraham's seed, all of the nations would be blessed through him. Uh, Israel, of course, was chosen to display God's glory in that way. And so when Daniel pleads for God's mercy, he pleads that God would restore them, not for his sake, not for the nation's sake, but for the sake of God's name. For the sake of God's glory. Daniel is concerned about God's reputation amongst the nations. And by restoring Jerusalem and forgiving the people of Israel, Daniel wants God's glory to be, to be magnified. And then notice in the last part of verse 18, Daniel says, For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. And so when you encounter difficulty, you know, you might find yourself, I find myself doing this, you know, I'm going through a difficult time of some kind, and I sort of, I, you know, I'm not really necessarily thinking about it, but internally I'm kind of like, why? Like, why is this happening to me? Why do I have to deal with this thing? And, you know, if you've ever been in that situation, poor, sort of the implicit message I think that undergirds that sort of response is that I don't really deserve this. You know, it's like, why is this happening? I didn't do anything. I shouldn't be dealing with this. But um, when we appeal to God on those grounds, um, it's sort of appealing to God on the basis of our own righteousness, right? Because whatever our lot in life is, things are infinitely better than what we deserve. And, and so we don't appeal to God on the basis of our righteousness. We appeal to him on the basis of his mercy. The, there was a course years ago, uh, Alistair Begg talked about this in one of his messages, but 
Uh, the course was called Evangelism Explosion. It was put out by D. James Kennedy, and um, he had these diagnostic questions, and you've probably heard these questions. Uh, one of the questions is, if you died today and appeared before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you tell him? Right? And it's a way of sort of seeing where um, people are, are placing their hope and their, their faith. And uh, if you ask most people on the street this question, they'll give you some version of, I'm a good person, right? Uh, I try to do the right thing. I don't take advantage of people. I give to charity when I have the opportunity. I, I, I've done the best I can with what I've had, um, something along those lines. And so most people acknowledge that they would appeal to God on the basis of their own righteousness, based on what they've done, based on how they've lived. Uh, but not Daniel, right? And that's interesting because Daniel is presented in the Bible as an eminently upstanding person. I can't think of one bad thing that the Bible has to say about Daniel. And yet when Daniel comes, he says, we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your mercy, right? And that's really the only appeal that can be made because uh, if we appeal to God on the basis of our own righteousness, the, the Bible says there is none righteous, not even one. Uh, all have sinned, uh, all have Con, uh, all stand condemned, and yet God is merciful, and God has demonstrated his mercy in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So uh, if you were to die today and appear before God and he was to ask you that question, there's no answer that can be given that begins with the word I. If you died today and appeared before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? Don't start with, well, I did this, or I did that. The only reason that any of us can be saved is because God is great and mercy. And so it's not because of what I did, it's because of what he did. He sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be forgiven and restored to a relationship with him. It's not because of my righteousness, it's because of his mercy. And so if we follow the example of Daniel, if we confess our sins, if we seek his mercy, he is faithful to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, uh, John says. So in uh, Daniel's prayer, Daniel appeals to God to intervene for the sake of his people. And that's exactly what God has done in our life. Uh, if our faith is in Christ, God has intervened in our lives. He has brought us salvation in order that his name might be magnified in us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have shown us your mercy, that our standing before you, that our eternal destiny doesn't hinge upon our ability to conform to your law because we know that uh, we have all failed in that regard. Uh, we have acted wickedly and corruptly. We um, often look at our, our wickedness and our depravity and we minimize it. We blame other people. Uh, and yet you are a God who is holy and our sin is grave and serious, uh, so grave and serious that the only hope that we have is in the perfect sacrifice that you have made. And so help us to, to fix our faith in you, to trust in Christ and his sacrifice. And we pray that you would continue that work that you have started in us, uh, knowing that you have sovereignly promised to do that very thing. And we pray these things all in Christ's name. Amen.